So we today uh, we talk about how to start with reduced tillage and so maybe a bit more things we will discuss. Um, I will start with an introduction just after this slide, uh, just to know a little bit who's in the house, let's say, and uh, shortly introduce the project in which this masterclass is uh, organized from. And then we will have a presentation by uh, Frederic Thomas. Um, he is uh, discovered the minimum tillage and conservation agriculture uh, during his internships in the, the USA, Australia, New Zealand, and got um, so enthusiastic that he applied it also on his farm already since 1996. So over the years, he has been building up quite some experience and he shares his uh, enthusiasm also in the in the base association uh, mm. and and also is editor of a magazine uh, on yeah if you translate it to English TSC this it's this on no tillage agriculture but you probably will tell about that in your presentation as well uh, so this is a long presentation but very interesting I can assure you um, so we will have a short break after that uh, well, we'll see somewhere five, ten minutes um, to get a coffee or uh, have a short um, refresh, some fresh air. And then I will invite James to shortly also uh, present his uh, farm and his uh, experience with us. And uh, then I would invite all of you to join uh, a lively discussion so we can have all the answers to the questions we have at the moment on them. Um, agriculture on the reduced tillage. OK, um, yeah, also, just also, but I think you are following it quite well. There's the rules of the meeting on an online setting. It's nice to have your microphone off during presentation so we don't hear when you get a call or somebody's at your door. Um, but if you do have a question, it's always nice to see the person that asks questions uh, or at least hear it. So then you can just un unmute your microphone. Uh, and ask your question, but you're also uh, if you if your microphone doesn't work or you're uncomfortable with asking, you can write your um, questions in the chat as well. Um, I think it's the most easy to have uh, first a presentation. So if you have questions already that pop up during the presentation, just put them in the chat. We will write them down and we'll come back to them after the presentation. So you don't have to remember it. You can just write it in the chat. And uh, last is that we will record this session because we would like to uh, publish the presentation that uh, Frederik is uh, sharing with us also to allow us to subtitle it to, to the other languages, uh, German, French, um, Luxembourg is possibly with it, German <laughs> and Dutch. Um, so there's, there's more people that can join in a later stage. Um, so it's not that you will be part of the, the audience will be part in the presentation. Uh, now, very shortly, the project. So here we're talking about uh, it's fabulous farmers, the project we're talking about, and we aim to promote the use of functional agrobiodiversity um, and for and you because or as a result, reduce the reliance on chemical inputs. Uh, fertilizers and pesticides and for that we work together with 13 organizations in uh, six different EU countries and with uh, 12 in these countries we have 12 pilot regions that uh, use different uh, FAP measures as we call them. What do we mean with functional agrobiodiversity? Basically, um, we interpret it as a targeted stimulation of biodiversity to deliver ecosystem services to agriculture. So which ones are useful for agriculture? Those are the, uh, for example, pollination, the pest and disease control, uh, the soil structure and the advantages that come from that and water regulation. There's quite some uh, services that also are helpful for the agricultural system. And uh, examples of FAP measures which we address in our projects are crop rotation, mixed crops, field margin management, cover crops, hedgerow management, agroforestry, uh, modifying manure quality, and also the non-inversion tillage, which we will discuss today. So for these different uh, measures, we yeah we try in different ways to share experiences with the partners that are involved in the project. Um, 
and in the end, yeah, we will have a we have a website I will share with you later and you will get it in the email where you can find also some knowledge um, the experience we have. Um, yeah, what we have learned throughout the project, you will go and find there. But um, we did. Before we start, I have two more questions for you, um, which you can answer by going to the, the website menti.com. You can do it on your phone or just on the computer. Um, there will be a link to the website in the chat uh, to where you can just say uh, where, what's your country of residence, so we know a little bit who's joining today. So I would like to invite you to go to menti.com and then you have to press the code 91465308. Mark Linde, it yeah. says voting is closed. Nee. Yeah. You have to put, uh, you have to press C, Mark Linde. Just I, and now? Yeah. Okay, ah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Wim. We have <clears throat> dominance of Belgians, or they find the easiest way to menti.com. <laughs> okay. So it's many Belgian people so far, Belgium, people from Belgium. Yes. That's how it look. we're couple, joining today. Couple French and uh, a, a couple uh, British people from UK. Oh, oh. There's some more. More in UK. <clears throat> Let's see. I can. I think there will be some. Okay, it's an indication. I guess in the end, the Belgians are the majority for today. And then the final question before we start is uh, what is your job or your occupation? To know a little bit uh, for the content. It's nice we have some farmers joining, farm advisors. Teachers. Technical manager probably is also can we indicate it as farm advisor. Ah, there's a someone from R Romania joining as well. Okay. So <coughs> I think it's nice. We have quite some farmers, farm advisors. And then the researchers, researchers. So it sounds like a, a good mixture we hoped for today. So I'm very much I welcome you to go and have a nice and lively discussion after the presentation. Good. Then I will stop sharing my screen, Frederik. You can take over. And um, I'm very looking forward to hear your story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, okay, can you see my presentation now? Is it okay? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, and we have the same problems that let, later on. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, well, I will. I will go back on on the, on the menu here. Let's see. I will. Uh, bureau, okay. And now you should be able to see my. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. <clears throat> it's working. I'm not an expert in uh, webinar, but uh, sooner or later I will become. Okay, so thanks for the invitation anyway, and uh, and uh, welcome uh, everyone from Belgium, UK. Uh, uh, and Luxembourg, France, and Romania, and 
uh, Netherlands and other countries. Uh, I will try to uh, explain a little bit uh, uh, what we do about that, what we think, what we have learned about cover crop, and and I will relate that to uh, my own farm. It will take about an hour, and uh, and then I'm open to any kind of question. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing I think uh, there is a big connection between uh, environment and economy, and and the word is agronomy. Um, First of all, uh, I farm in Southern France, uh, a quite limited uh, soil, uh, quality soil area. So the, the yield um, were limited and the economical return were limited. As, <clears throat> so that what forced me uh, to change with the, um, the background that I had in other countries. Uh, the bottom is very clay, like you can see on the picture, and the top is very sandy and acidic. So that's uh, quite of a... Uh, big challenge to be farming in this area. Uh, we changed quite drastically when I started, uh, went to cover crop, mixed cover crop, and went to no-till. Uh, this is the same field in November after drilling the barley. And uh, so we like to be green all the time if it's possible. And that is the same field in February. It's not this year, it's some years ago. Uh, that's to give you an idea how my farm looks most of the time. Um, then uh, 10 years ago, we start to introduce sheep on the farm as we were growing quite a lot of uh, biomass during uh, intercropping uh, time. And we thought it was a good opportunity to feed sheep at a time where the pasture were a very scarce of forage. Uh, that's how the farm looked like in October. And uh, so we had corn and the sheep were grazing before the, the mice and the sheep are grazing. You can see the little square here. It's dynamic grazing. They are grazing the cover crop for the next year, uh, next year mice. Uh, the moment I got 200 sheep grazing on my farm and my farm is uh, more or less 140 something uh, hectares. Uh, I like to start by uh, Leva Angers. It's a, a kind of a special experiment they made uh, a few years ago. And uh, it's the same soil, same mixed. And, but uh, one of the pot has been sterilized by, uh, by high temperature. And uh, usually we think uh, that uh, when we're killing the soil life, it's not going better. But it's a contrary uh, on this uh, example uh, because uh, the uh, left container, it's where the soil life has been sterilized. And this really showed the paradox of agriculture, of farming, that we have to have some kind of aggression of this on the soil to get the fertility and to get the, the plants growing. So the, uh, the idea is how we can manage to live in between those two. Um, this is a picture that comes from Denmark and just a pass of uh, a shallow cultivation really um, mineralized quite a lot. And so we, most of the farmers of the farm, we are addicted to tillage because we um, in, in need a lot of uh, mineralization. And uh, this has been showed by uh, one of my friends, Don Rekowski in the United States, and he was measuring um, how much CO2 uh, you get uh, after five hours of tillage or 24 hours of tillage. And uh, you really show a big difference between the mobile plow and the no-till, which are the two extreme. He really um, picture that just... Uh, I mean, tilling was just like opening a bottle of champagne. You got a lot of CO2 leaving the soil. Uh, this is another presentation showing that uh, when you just plow, which in French is labour, uh, you got a kind of a, a strong micro activity doing mineralization. And when you are in travail simplifié, in minimum tillage, uh, it's very low, but uh, afterwards uh, the the biological activity is, is, is higher. So it's more or less more a question of timing than the quantity. Um, tillage have an enormous impact. Uh, this is a picture that has been taken uh, in uh, Mediterranean. It's, that's a river Aude. 
uh, arriving near Carcassonne and Perpignan arriving in the Mediterranean. And uh, we call that uh, um, Maron uh, tide. And, um, and that you can see a lot of rivers are sending a lot of ground in the sea. And so tillage is impacting water cycle, carbon cycle, and mineral cycle, as I introduced about nitrogen. And uh, erosion caused by tillage is not something very recent. Uh, that is the city of Rome. And if you look at the, where the harbor of the Roman uh, were, it's about a few miles inland now. And all that is land that has been eroded all through the time. So erosion is not something new. Uh, but uh, when you, your eyes start to be open to that, you can see erosion uh, anywhere where there is farming and where there is tillage. And on this picture, we can really see the depth of the plow and the depth of the power arrow that uh, prepares the soil. And it could be uh, even more expensive when you have to bring back the ground. And, and it is also expensive for the community because uh, they have to clean the road, they have to clean the ditches. And in some areas in France, uh, uh, departments uh, are talking about uh, making the farmers pay for the, for the ground that uh, they, there is in the ditch in the road. And uh, that's a little river uh, running next to my house in, in Brittany. And when you look at that, it's quite amazing. There is grass everywhere, but uh, this ground <coughs> is coming from the corn field, uh, which are probably uh, 10 kilometers away. But uh, it's not what you grow, it's how you grow which make uh, water pollution. And uh, we think we can uh, really change uh, the question of water. And I think you have been working on that in your, in your uh, uh, study. Um, uh, most of the time, and sorry that we call that conservation agriculture, and, but it is more regenerating soil. And uh, here it's a uh, clay soil in Eastern France, very well impacted and uh, very well compacted. Uh, and so after three years of change of management, we really uh, moved the soil to a, a better condition. So, so we are more in uh, regeneration than, than uh, strict going from one tilling to no till. And uh, this is another study and, uh, and uh, research uh, area in Switzerland, in Oberacker near Bern. And uh, there is 15 years difference between those four spades. And you can see a big difference. And so the difference uh, uh, you can tell with organic matter, the color. Uh, and, and then it hides something that is quite difficult to uh, integrate. That's uh, when you have a CN ratio close to uh, uh, 10. That means that's when you change of one point of organic matter, you will um, uh, immobilized uh, 2,500 kilograms of nitrogen, which is quite a lot. So carbon sequestration, nitrogen immobilization. And what uh, makes things quite hard to understand and work in our countries. But now uh, I'm not the only one that has changed. And uh, there is people that have started changing 30, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, and, and so on. And uh, now we can see uh, quite good references. And when you see wheat roots uh, going uh, two meter deep, that's really something. Uh, this is another picture I took in uh, Belgium. And, uh, and it is a sugar beet roots <coughs> that were three meter deep. So following earthworm channel, uh, this means that you are quite uh, resilient to a uh, lack of water during the summer, if that happened in Belgium. Um, another areas of soil, we are in very calcareous soil in uh, east of Paris and we are in, in La Marne. And uh, well, you can bring color back to the soil. It took 15 years to this farmer and that is the oil seed ripe moving out. So uh, it's not only giving color to the soil, the better soil means also a better crop and e easier to grow. But uh, I like to say there is 15 years between those two. Uh, it's another type of soil again, 
uh, to show that it works in quite all type of soil. We are in southern France in a very silty soil. And uh, if, if there is no rain tomorrow, I mean, uh, I think most of you will agree that the corn on the right will survive better. If there is only 50 millimeters, still the corn on the right will appreciate. And if there is a very heavy rain of, let's see, two or 300 millimeters in an hour, the corn on the right will be the one uh, surviving better. So that's why uh, that's a way to show, <coughs> sorry, that uh, I mean, this kind of approach bring a lot of resilience, whatever happened. And this is on my farm. You can see the sand on the top of the soil. And now with the earthworm, I got more organic matter. Uh, and I even think that uh, the earthworm are bringing back some of the clay that is underneath. But uh, I haven't got any research to uh, show that now. Uh, and, and better soil means better crop. That's a picture I took on my farm in uh, 2014, a good year for mice. And that's the difference of mice between me and my neighbor. And my neighbor asked me about the variety that I planted. I think uh, we have probably the same variety, but the big difference is not the variety. The big difference is not, not how I till the soil. The big difference is what kind of soil I built and with a better soil, I was able to grow a better crop. And uh, <coughs> uh, I saw also in your study a lot of questions about water management. Um, we change a lot of things about the water management. Uh, you have already a better rooting due to better soil structure and elsewhere. Um, you also preserve uh, a lot of uh, uh, residue on the top of the soil that limited uh, evaporation and heating of the soil. And, and also, uh, because of the earthworm uh, channel, you can infiltrate heavy rain very fast. Uh, we color uh, the water that we put on the soil in, on an infiltration test on one of my field with blue. And, and uh, we got 100 millimeters a minute at the beginning of uh, infiltration. It's amazing. I was even myself amazed of the amount of water my soil could soak at the beginning. And it, the soil can soak the water because there is big channel that can let the air get out of the soil as the water is getting in. There is also a big question about carbon. And if we look at uh, the conventional carbon cycle, uh, while well, it's getting out of the soil or out of uh, uh, animals or out of human, but uh, what, does, what is taking carbon back into the air is some kind of life, using the energy that is stored into those carbon connections. And then this is releasing, I mean, N, P, K, S, and so on. And, uh, and it is taken back by photosynthesis uh, thanks to sunlight. But we are for, forgotten, I mean, a short cycle. And if your soil is alive, this means that you will breathe and it will uh, inhale uh, CO2 all the time, which is stored into the crop canopy, and which uh, making a kind of uh, glass house effect and increase the photosynthesis uh, efficiency. This means that um, with uh, conservation agriculture, we can synchronize the C and the N cycle, which is something which is very amazing and once again improving the efficiency and the crop production. And why I'm talking carbon, let's get a little bit further on this subject. Uh, I'm not going to tell you anything about, uh, I mean, uh, ch the climate change, but if you look at the evolution of CO2, uh, there is a big ch change between spring and and summer and the winter and most of the emerged ground on the globe are on the north hemisphere this means that the when you see that it's going down during the summer uh, you see the the impact of the photosynthesis that is able to to capture a lot of carbon uh, photosynthesis of the cropping land but also of the forest of the pastures 
This means that if we can increase photosynthesis, we will reduce uh, drastically the amount of carbon being in the atmosphere. And if we are serious at reducing the emission, I don't think why we shouldn't uh, level up the curve uh, thanks to uh, carbon management, thanks to photosynthesis. About uh, climate change, we also have to think that the hotspot are first of all cities uh, and roads and uh, airports and all things like that. But the other hotspots are land that are not covered, uh, land that are dry and open to the sun during the summer. And this uh, increases uh, uh, the, the height of the cloud and the cloud will get away. Forest or green spot will lower the cloud and attract the rain. Uh, we made a very uh, easy experiment uh, last uh, September in uh, south of France in uh, what we call the, the meeting Tech and Bio in Valence, south of Lyon. And we measure the temperature of a till soil uh, in the middle of the afternoon. It was only 31 degrees Celsius. It was early September, a conventional temperature for this area. But the soil was 47 degrees and the soil on the cover was 29 degrees. So basically 20 degrees difference uh, in between those two soils uh, because one was uncovered and chill and dry and the other, one, the other one was covered with a green cover crop. So you can really change uh, the temperature of the soil and have a very strong impact. It is why what many farmers in uh, central United States have done. And in this area, the blue one, the temperature since 1970 have changed positively, which means that the temperature has been reduced of 0.5 degrees Celsius compared to other areas where the temperature has been increased of 0.5 degrees Celsius. I mean, there is no big cities in those areas, it's very country uh, and farming areas. The only thing they've done, they completely changed their way of farming. Oh, wow. And yeah. farming with dry, what they were calling dry farming, now they grow a lot of crop every year, every summer, and they grow also uh, corn and soya bean and mixed cover crop as well. All the ground is farmed. And so the, <clears throat> the idea about CO2 is following H2O. So it is the same thing. So it is very coherent and logical. So I like this sentence, it farm the sun to harvest the rain. And I think it is something I like to put forward. Uh, on my farm, own farm, we have measured the, the carbon thanks to soil capital carbon, uh, Belgium company. And, um, and last year for uh, 2021, 20, uh, sorry, I was to minus 160, 76 uh, ton of CO2. Uh, uh, so it's more than one ton per hectare, and which is uh, in terms of uh, car, uh, 1 million point two kilometers uh, with my car. So now, thanks to my farm, I can go three times around the globe with my car and I'm still neutral. There is also companies in France. I was uh, last week with Nathais growing popcorn and they're starting to uh, finance carbon to the farmers. Uh, thanks to level of the cover crop the farmers are growing, it's basically around 20 euros a ton of cover crop. Uh, and though they are growing popcorn in that kind of cover crop. Um, there is also a program that it's more research at the moment organized by Avril and Sepol uh, to grow camelina uh, in a second crop in order to extract oil and 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 grow uh, biodiesel thanks to this oil and this oil will also attract some carbon uh, credit um, the big uh, request of today was also about cover crop and uh, uh, I like to use this sentence it's to replace steel by roots, fuel by photosynthesis, urea by nodules, and a part of agrochemicals by diversity. That's uh, basically my program with cover crop. Um, over the years, we learn how to grow what we call biomass, 
or biomax, which is stand for maximal biomass and maximal biodiversity. We usually grow four to ten tons after winter cereals. Uh, we mixed up to uh, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen plants together. Uh, so it's a really a high biodiversity, and this helped to produce more biomass to explore all the soil and the structure as well. Uh, quite uh, helpful on weed management, and he helped to reduce the the cost of seed, which seems to be to be surprising, but uh, more uh, it's not because you have more type of seed that is more costly to increase the diversity. And sometimes we have some kind of relay. And basically, whatever happened, we have cover crop. And cover crop is something that increase also the, the food for the soil life. I mean, there is no doubt if you want more soil life, you have to grow uh, more crop, more diversity to add more photosynthesis to the system. And it is very well connected to the amount of photosynthesis and to the, the, the continuous of photosynthesis and the diversity of the photosynthesis. Also, the cover crop is also a way to increase the quality of the food that you are bringing back to the soil. For example, if uh, the rotation is too high in carbon and cellulose, uh, uh, the, the cover crop will bring more sugar uh, should bring more sugar, should bring more nitrogen. Uh, it could be the opposite. Uh, you have a rotation uh, more uh, on uh, uh, very sugar and uh, nitrogen uh, residue. Uh, we use a cover crop to bring more uh, more cellulose and more lignin in order to have more organic matter in the system. And that's how we how we associate plant together. Uh, so there is no uh, uh, magical recipe. Uh, just try to to follow uh, some uh, uh, good sense, and uh, you will find a way to uh, organize plant. Uh, there is plant that are tutor. There is plant that are winding plants. There is legume. There is like the radish in the soil, uh, but uh, there is all kind of mixes. And we found that with those mixes, we were really improving uh, the biomass that we were able to grow all over the years. That is uh, one of the biggest trials we've done with Baz in 2005. And I can recall that uh, our knowledge really was uh, set up about cover crop at that time. One of the best cover crop I grew on a farm was in uh, 2011. Uh, I grew uh, basically uh, 10 tons of cover crop and uh, now we have the Mercy system and I have 253 kilograms of nitrogen in that cover crop. In another cover crop I have 182 kilograms of nitrogen which don't, don't mean the amount I will have for the next crop. It means the amount that was stored, capitalized and so that was my best cover crop. My worst cover crop was in uh, 2019, no cover crop at all. So I didn't show the, the picture. So that's basically in 20 years uh, what I made. I went from 10 to no. And, but on average, uh, more around four to six, seven. And that was for NPK. Uh, cover crop was also something interesting to manage the weeds. Uh, so if you do nothing, weeds will grow. So we used to uh, grow cover crop instead, and you have to reach four or five tons of dry matter in order to manage the weeds. That's a place I, a place I, I missed to seed on my farm, and I was not happy but uh, to see that I still have a lot of weeds, but um, I was on the other side happy to see that the cover crop uh, do manage those weeds pretty well. Uh, that's another try we made around the farm uh, at a neighbor place just to show that uh, a cover crop or oilseed drape in a very dry uh, summer uh, do manage the weeds better uh, than a cover crop on the right, which is a crimson clover and uh, see nightshade growing and a lot of weeds growing. 
And, and this is a place where we didn't plant any cover crop and there is buckwheat on the further right. And you see just the pass, the pass of the drill on the left side started all, all the weeds, but uh, uh, so it is something very sensible. When, when you drill, you will really uh, give a go to a lot of things, the crop, but also the weeds. Um, the cover crop also let us start to be opportunist. I will come back on that. This means that the, when the cover crop is nice, I mean, sometimes we harvest it as a, as a crop. Uh, and then we, some people in south of France, I was on their farms uh, last uh, Thursday, uh, go to two cover crops on a row when you start having from July to almost April. Uh, next year, that's being a big, big cap, big time. Uh, it is impossible to have only one cover crop being efficient. So we go first a cover crop of summer crop, then we relay with uh, legume for the winter and the next spring. We see some North American uh, going to uh, being on the green all the time. And uh, something we are uh, starting to look at seriously and one of my friends in Pennsylvania, Steve Grove, is working like that now. A uh, big mat of uh, cover crop in order to manage the weeds and also to manage the, the water. And which uh, bring me to uh, weeds management. I had some question about that. And it is a very big challenge, even with herbicide, even with glyphosate at the moment. And so uh, also we have resistance. And, and the, our conservation agriculture approach bring uh, different ideas. And, uh, and so we reorganize the rotation uh, in order to um, manage the weeds. And the big learning we had is that uh, weed seeds are surviving in the soil a long time. It could be uh, 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 years, even more. So if we don't bring weeds back, um, they will not germinate. And the second big thing is that uh, most of the weeds, seeds are being eliminating at the top of the soil a lot faster than in the soil. So by using multiple strategy, we can really shuffle uh, the story and uh, trick the weeds in order to be in, uh, in management. This is a good example I took in uh, central France in uh, an, in area of La Sarta. Uh, on, on the left, it is an area that has been tilled. You see all the weeds and uh, volunteer. And on the right, I mean, no till. So it was a dry summer and really showed the difference. And so we can capitalize on, on no till on some extent uh, for this. Um, we have learned thanks to United States, also thanks to Switzerland, that the rotation was a very powerful uh, tool. And uh, we try to put ourselves in what we call a low pressure uh, uh, area where the weeds are low. And if the weeds problem is low, we have never, never weeds. But if the weeds problem is low, you can work differently and uh, try to change be before the weeds problems start again. So it's kind of an uh, interesting way to look at it and to show you how we can manage now. We are going on an organic farm in uh, Western France, in Département Loire-Atlantique. And on the left, it's a cover crop in, uh, that has been uh, drilled and it's very dry. It is mid-September, uh, two years ago. And on the right, it, uh, it is a uh, hemp that has been harvested. And uh, so I saw it look closer. And all the weeds uh, underneath the hemp were summer weeds. They were not winter weeds. So we decide with the farmer to direct drill. is organic. He's done nothing but going with the direct drill and put some fertilizer in, in a row, organic fertilizer. So the, on the left, you got the cover crop that has been growing. We are in mid-November and in the middle, you got the field with no other thing that just draining direct into the field. Um, it has been 
quite a warm November. So in December, all most of the summer weeds were still here and has been growing as well. You see the cover crop on the left that is growing. So that is was kind of scary a little bit. And during those, that was during the early winter. But then we had a little bit of frost that started cleaning the field. So it is uh, uh, end of December, early January. And this is, uh, I would say, February. And the cover crop is killed by some light frost. And that's how it, it was looking in, in February. And that was in, uh, in uh, April. Uh, so at this time, is mulching the cover crop in order to plant the other row. It's, it's, it's a, a special try where they're doing uh, uh, lines into be in, inside the field and running line by line. And so that's the field. And it finished up by a uh, quite good crop for organic farmer, uh, 3.6 ton per hectare. Uh, so it was not, not bad. And he's doing it again uh, this year. And it's uh, oats on the other side where there is a hemp. Um, rotation or changing the rotation help also on different uh, diseases like uh, mycotoxin. And uh, if you are good for the weeds or if you are managing the weeds uh, by changing the rotation, usually it's not. It's a good thing for other problems you can have. Then we come to uh, glyphosate. And uh, so there is a uh kind of a lot of controversy see or uh debate about the glyphosate and uh i like to say uh well whether you have that whether you have that so glyphosate really help us to move forward in this kind of agriculture and it's still helping us quite a lot and uh, uh we have been trying to look at solution but uh, INHA is also looking at different uh, solutions to replace the glyphosate. But uh, so far, if you look at all the red uh, dot, is uh, where there is no solution yet. So there's still a lot of work to do in order to, to replace uh, this, especially in conservation agriculture. Uh, this doesn't mean that we are trying to find excuses, but we are finding solution. And for example, this is a field planted with wheat and uh, it was a clean of uh, grass. And so the, the farmer only used a broad leaf and the field gave that and give that further. Uh, so no, no glyphosate application and only conventional herbicide uh, to do that in no-till. And we follow also what the people from Switzerland have done and uh, in uh, you the usage of glyphosate and they uh, little by little and they started in 1994 went down from uh, basically uh, uh, a glyphosate application every year to a glyphosate application every uh, two three or five years uh, but it, it is quite hard but uh, we are moving in that direction anyway uh, there is a lot of people. Yeah. 30, 30 more minutes. 15 more minutes. Okay. 30, 30. Okay. So I am all right about the timing so far. Yeah. Is it okay for everyone? I think so. I don't see questions. So go ahead. Okay. So I can follow. They find that interesting. <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of thumbs and uh, applause popping up in the screen. So um, okay, okay, I think okay. they're uh, eager to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so this brings a lot of uh, research about uh, different ideas, and there we are with the electro electroherm from Zazo that is able to kill uh, cover crops and weeds for with uh, high electricity, high voltage. Uh, but it is very uh, energy consuming and uh, well, it's killing the cover crop. But the, the problem that we have is not the cover crop. We can roll the cover crop and that, that we know how to manage that is uh, the, the young seedling of weeds in, in the bottom of the cover crop. So uh, I, I'm not saying we are getting away from that, but uh, this is interesting 
because uh, the pressure is uh, uh, st stirring a lot of minds and uh, some good ideas will come out. Um, we also work with organic farmers and that is uh, uh, in the uh, area of Alsace near Strasbourg, uh, an organic farmer uh, planting wheat into a cover crop after faba beans. And uh, in that uh, case, you have to go with mustard with a very heavy mustard in order to capture the nitrogen, but also to get the, the weeds down, to get the nitrogen down. And uh, it's uh, his own cedar and uh, it's after seeding. And it's uh, then when the, the winter start coming and uh, then it's in the you know, middle of the winter. So we can do sometimes things like that. Uh, the problem is so far we, we know how to do those uh, seeding and a crop, but to do it constantly with no herbicide, we don't know yet. Uh, it's another uh, way to overcome glyphosate on my farm. Just after barley, winter barley, uh, early June, we plant oilseed rape and, uh, and canola together uh, uh, and uh, buckwheat, oilseed rape and buckwheat. So it's very early for oilseed rape. And then, uh, when the summer come, uh, we got uh, the buckwheat that we can use as a double crop and the oilseed rape is underneath and uh, is being a little patient. And uh, when we arrive in October, we got uh, a second harvest of buckwheat, uh, it, which is optional, but the oilseed rape is underneath and uh, is following. We even uh, made uh, an addition to this to add clover, uh, uh, draft clover, that will uh, be able to cover after we harvest the, uh, the, the uh, oilseed rape. So by one seeding, we can have almost three, three crops uh, or two crops and a cover crop. Uh, this brought us to companion crop in uh, OSR. And uh, that's this conventional OSR, and that is uh, OSR with companion crop. And so it, it, that really changed our mind. And now it is uh, uh, well documented in, in, in France, at least, that uh, with no till and with companion crop in OSR, we can manage quite easily some of the weeds, not all the weeds, but quite easily most of the weeds. Uh, which means that an uh, oilseed rape field today have a, a very surprising look. And uh, it doesn't look like a conventional field. And this helps also to uh, fool most of the insects that are very specific to uh, oilseed rape. So it's what we call an agroecological way to manage uh, most of the problems in oilseed rape. We have good research that saw that the yield doesn't change, even go up. And uh, as a Swiss, uh, say you farm your herbicide. And uh, that's how it's look during the early winter. And that's uh, some of the Swiss recipe that is keep evolving. But uh, they plant uh, Niger, buckwheat, lentil, um, uh, sub-Mediterranean clover, veg, uh, jess and, 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 and beans, uh, all with uh, OSR. So as you see, it's a very high diversity at the beginning, but it is a crop finally. About insect, it's fantastic. We were not thinking we will fool the insect as, as much as we do, but uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be uh, not uh, checking your fields, but they really change what's happening in your field. And it helps also to become opportunist, opportunistic. This is my, my colleague, Christophe. I planted a cover crop like me with a mixture and everything freeze except the oilseed rape. And so he decided to keep the oilseed rape, put fertilizer and harvest the oilseed rape. On another part of the field where he had some weeds still, uh, he planted a uh, spring barley that uh, was the plan A. And that's how the field were looking like. A bit thick uh, for oilseed rape, but uh, it was a cover crop at the beginning. Uh, another thing I've done on the farm is replanted it to my oilseed rape. Uh, uh, winter peas, uh, forage winter peas, Austrian winter peas, 
And when the oilseed rape uh, is finished flowering, the winter peas were on the top of the oilseed rape. I had some beans into it. So we harvest everything with a combine harvester. And it goes well in the combine harvester as well. So this means that we can, thanks to this diversity, find, farm our biodiversity. And uh, for example, we learn a lot about slugs. And that was a big problem at the beginning. And uh, thanks to the diversity, we, we manage slugs now a lot better. And we even found out slugs now in our field that are eating slugs. So that's, there is slugs that are predators to other slugs, which uh, is quite amazing. We didn't thought about that uh, at the beginning. And uh, we also found a way for the slug to keep some of the cover crop they like better, like oilseed rape. And as you can see on this picture, they are feeding on the, on the volunteer oilseed rape, but not uh, feeding on the wheat, which means that you are safe. You don't have to spray. And uh, some research of Inra Dijon, uh, I'd like to say thanks to Sandrine Petit, uh, say that um, there is carabidae underneath that are feeding on seed and they can eat uh, around 1,000 to 4,000 seeds per square meter per day. It's a lot. I asked her three times. I was not sure. I understood well. It's 1,000 to 4,000 weed seeds per square meter per day. So if you, you know, grow cover crop, doesn't till them and kill them, let them leave. They can do a big job in weed management uh, as well as the slugs. It's also great for the bees. We are two beekeepers on the farm because uh, you have a lot more flowers and uh, we also organize the farm in order to have flowers all the time uh, between March and uh, uh, let's say November in order to have a kind of relay between the flowers on the farm. We have a special program for that. It opened the path to new opportunities as well with the animals. And uh, that's why we reintroduce the animals on the farm. And the animals are, uh, I mean, uh, val uh, giving a better value to the cover crop without taking out, I mean, the, the cover crop because they are uh, leaving uh, the manure in the fields and they're stimulating as well uh, the soil life. It's also for many uh, animal farmers around the country a way to have a forage at the end of the summer or in the middle of the summer where most of the pasture are very scarce. So, and we found out that uh, uh, animals production is really connected to soil quality. And uh, as ourselves, we were quite connected to soil quality by cover crop, no tillage and feeding the soil. I mean, there is a very close relationship and it was easy for us to jump into that story as well. Uh, it's also new opportunities. Uh, that's my cover crop last summer. I put the sheep into this. So they are really uh, Tasmanian tigers. And uh, as I had oilseed rape, uh, when you come a few days after they've been grazing, I mean, it could be a way to manage uh, the cover crop and get a, a field of oilseed rape. So we got new ideas with that. So there is a a great challenge and a great future in, in animal production integrated in uh, conservation practices. Uh, all that bring new, new ideas. So it's using alfalfa in, as a permanent cover crop uh, for different crop. So just try to keep the field green all the time. And uh, so it's quite challenging to manage, quite hard to do it with no herbicide. And, uh, but the idea is to, when you harvest, I mean, the cover crop is already there growing. And so why not? But this is uh, hard on management. And uh, but you can have maybe a second cut of forage afterwards. Uh, a co-op has been doing that on, on, on corn, on mice. So we use strip till and fertilizer placement. Uh, but it is a big change in southern France to see corn a mice growing in the middle of uh, white clover like that. Um, uh, CA also an impact potato production. This is a, 
uh, the ridge has been done in 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 the fall in in the autumn and the cover crop has been planted in that which means that you can probably in the future be able to plant potatoes in in green cover crop that will change a lot of things so this is starting to move this also impact orchard production uh, because there is a lot of cover crop to grow also on orchard we are in prune trees in southern france apple trees in in 49 is uh, it's it is at uh, mr mr peno uh, marilyn know know him i think uh, it impact also the vineyard uh, the vineyard in many areas of france are starting to grow quite a lot of cover crop uh, and that we can see a quite a good impact on 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 the must on the not on the wine but on the must we have more nitrogen on the must and it is quite interesting uh, to uh, qualify the fermentation. Uh, I have also some good friends. They grow lavender in southern France, and uh, they have been storing cover crop like crazy. And so now we see cover crop in lavender fields. And uh, last year, I even got one that he pushed the cover crop all the way to harvest it in the middle of the lavender. Uh, so he harvest uh, uh, Durham wheat in the middle of the lavender fields. Oh, it's amazing what people are starting to do now. Um, it even impact in horticulture as well. So we're quite happy with this. Uh, it impact also on banana production. I mean, we have the chance uh, in France to have uh, a highland in the Caribbean, uh, and we are growing bananas over there. I have a chance to go there uh, sometime, and it's amazing what those guys are starting to do. They're doing the same thing as we have done in, in, in our production. And uh, last year I was in uh, Guadalupe and Martinique, and it is what a farmer is starting to do so we got pineapple we got uh, uh, piment we got uh, eggplant and we got banana all growing in the same place so it's a uh, really something interesting what's happening at the moment in uh, in France so my last slide uh, it is it is uh, uh, we are condemned to uh, increase photosynthesis anyway, uh, to produce food and fiber. That's the role of agriculture. And most of the time, or most of the people are starting to forget that farming is to produce food and fiber, uh, to produce seed, because one of the main input will be seed. Uh, also, uh, to grow local forage. Uh, and as you've seen with our animals, there is a big uh, opportunities to, to produce that kind of forage to supply energy to the soil life. Uh, well, it's true that the earthworm, the carabidae, uh, the mycorrhizae are uh, doing the organization of the soil, but they need a lot of energy to do that. And that is still photosynthesis um, to feed the surrounding, surrounding ecosystem. Uh, feed the bees, feed the deers, feed the wild games. Uh, uh, on my farm, we also feed the wild pigs, which are a little bit a nuisance, but uh, well, it's part of the biodiversity. And at the moment, I still have a hard time to admit them. But uh, we are trying to find new ways to overcome them, to produce true renewable energy. Uh, I like to say, and I look uh, at the figures for France, uh, at the moment, uh, the energy balance for only agriculture, and I will be able to debate on that, uh, is one for four. This means that when you put one energy into agriculture, you harvest four times the energy you put in the system, which is the, uh, very interesting in terms of renewable energy. Uh, supply organic compound. A lot of uh, companies now are looking for uh, bio uh, sourced uh, element, and only uh, photosynthesis will be able to produce that. Supply uh, green chemical for the industry. Uh, the, the lavender that I explained is uh, 
one an example the surprise uh, um, uh, fla flagrants uh, synthetic flagrants so now we have to grow more lavenders in order to bring uh, lavender fragrance. So agriculture is not the cause of uh, all the earth's problem, but uh, is uh, at, at the heart of many of the solution. And I forgot to, uh, to bring uh, the last, uh, but not the least uh, part is the four two thousand uh, about carbon sequestration brought by uh, uh, the uh, Mr. Mr. Lefol uh, at uh, the meeting, the CAP meeting, uh, COP meeting in, in Paris. And I think with this, we are doing a lot more than uh, for 2000. Thank you very much for, for, for all your attention. And now I think we will have uh, ample time to discuss all those subjects.